In the interview today, Dylan Taylor, he is CEO and chairman of Voyager Space. And he is considered a leader in the private space industry. Thank you for being with us today, Dylan, here in Davos. So, you are aiming to construct and launch a private space station by the year 2028. Is this realistic? It's, I mean, it's only four years to go. Yes. Well, it is realistic. Uh, we have the International Space Station today. Uh, it's old. We've had humans up there continuously for over 20 years. Uh, so it will come down. Uh, currently forecasted around 2030. So it's really important for many nations to have the replacement in orbit before the International Space Station comes down. I do think 2028 is realistic. Have you started building it already? No, we're in the design phase currently. We had uh, several milestones with NASA recently, and we have passed those milestones, but we still need to complete our design. And once that's complete, then we will start construction. So what will be different if you compare to the ISS, for example? A couple of things will be different. So, for example, the uh, modules on the International Space Station are four meters in diameter. That's large, but not super large, because when you put racking and other machinery inside the module, it just leaves enough room barely for a human fully outstretched. Ours is an eight meter uh, design module, and so much more volume, uh, much more opportunity to do to, to research. This is why we call it Star Lab. Uh, much more uh, room for the astronauts to move around. This will also take advantage of modern systems, whether it's carbon scrubbing to take CO2 out of the environment within, uh, within the uh, uh, spacecraft, or solar power or um, communication protocol from space to Earth. It will all be newer systems than what exists on the International Space Station. That means m many more tests are possible to, to do in this new Star Lab, it will be called? Yeah. That's right. Yeah, so microgravity, which is what you experience when you're in free fall, which the space station, of course, is in continuous free fall, is a magic uh, wand, if you will. If you do research in these conditions, you can get perfect crystals. You can get uh, three-dimensional models for protein folding. You can do drug development in ways that you can only do in human models or animal models here on Earth. So it really is a huge opportunity. And we say you go to space to benefit Earth, and this very much is an example of that. But what will be the advantages if we can do all these tests? Why should we do these tests, you know? Because there are a lot of drugs that we meaning humanity have developed, but we haven't formulated them correctly. Formulation is very important for its efficacy so that it works. Formulation is all about modeling, and uh, again, if you do it in microgravity, it is much more effective uh, to do that uh, formulation. And so I think the promise for, uh, and this is just one example, there are many others, the promise for humanity is that we can develop drugs on uh, the station that we can't develop easily here on Earth, and we can have breakthrough drug developments that would save millions of lives, theoretically. So can you imagine not just one private space station, several space, station, uh, space stations in, in space? And I, I do. I do. I think they'll be specialized. So I think we'll have uh, stations such as ourselves very, very heavily focused on research. I think others will be, be uh, very heavily focused on manufacturing. Uh, I can imagine a sovereign nation maybe wanting their own space station, as an example. Uh, so I would imagine by the end of the 2020s, maybe early 2030s, that there should be two or three, maybe four of these operating. And why does it have to be privately organized? I mean, wouldn't it be more sensible if states invest and so on and, you know, it's not private because it's probably for the better good? I understand that argument, but the example of the space shuttle in the U.S. is a good one. So NASA had the space shuttle. Unfortunately, there were two crashes, fatalities with that. And it was about 100,000 US dollars uh, per uh, half kilo to send mass to orbit. Enter their launch agreement that they awarded to uh, SpaceX and others. Now we can reland rocket boosters, and the price is now 1,000 US dollars per half kilogram, a 100x reduction. So when you outsource this to the private sector, you get more innovation. Uh, presumably, it's developed faster. And the government benefits because of lower costs, and they can be a customer instead of an owner. And it's a much better model. But you want to make money as well, of course. 
Yeah, I mean, money is, is an important part of it, but more important to us as an enterprise, uh, our mission is to accelerate the growth and uh, potential of humanity. So we very much are in it for the power of space to transform our civilization and, and our world. I had the pleasure of being in space myself. I've seen the Earth from space. It was a life-changing moment for me. And so that's the passion we bring, is uh, we really want to use space as a benefit to all humans here on Earth. When about was it when you were in space? And, and could you tell us a bit more, please? Well, it, it was a life-changing moment. And it's been said before, I think there have been about 620 people who have been to space. Universally, whether it's American or Russian or you know, atheist, Christian, it doesn't matter, male, female, everyone has this overview effect, as we call it. And it's tremendously powerful. And you see the Earth, it's been said there's no borders. You realize we all live in the same house, uh, literally and figuratively. There is no other place, there's only here. And outside this miracle of Earth, you have a cold, hostile, dark, and lifeless black space. And so um, you really learn to treasure what we have here and uh, value what it is that we have to preserve here. Do you think it's really easy to get parts for that future Star Lab up in space? Yes, because we now have reusable, inexpensive, reliable launch. We're launching rockets to space, we meaning humanity, roughly every three and a half days right now. That's unheard of. Last year we sent 2,400 satellites to space. That's a, a satellite launched every three hours on average. That's amazing. So the elevator, so to speak, has been built. Now we need to uh, put the applications and the destinations in space. But can't it get a bit crowded in space? I mean... It can. So we do have uh, a space debris issue. And uh, here in Davos, uh, the aerospace and, uh, group, of which I'm a part and Voyager is a part, is very focused on uh, sustainability of space and space debris. We've worked on what's called a space sustainability index so that we can advise on whether satellites are sustainable or not. Uh, but it is an issue and we need to take it very seriously. And what does it mean, sustainable, that it comes back, for example? Yes, there's a way to uh, make sure that the satellites or whatever, whatever is in orbit doesn't become junk. And it either needs to be deorbited or fixed, repaired, uh, one of the above, but it can't just be junk floating around. Uh, just to give you an idea, a little piece of metal about the size of a screw in orbit is about 100 pounds, uh, 20, whatever it is, 40 kilos of TNT dynamite because it's going at um, such an amazing speed, 25,000 kilometers per hour. So that force is equivalent to 100 pounds of uh, TNT. So who are you talking to then uh, to, to avoid these kind of problems in the future? Well, there are commercial companies and also governments that are uh, analyzing all the debris up there. That's one issue is knowing where it is. The second is to ha have the algorithms to know what's likely to collide. That's called a conjunction. And the third is if you know what the debris is and what's going to happen, what do I do? Do I go up, down, sideways? Um, so uh, those are the things that are being built out by governments and private industry. So we're getting there, uh, but we still have some work to do. Can you describe to us uh, the different stages of building Starlab? Because obviously you, in the future you also need astronauts, for example. Yes, indeed. So uh, you have a very um, uh, focused system requirement review. That's where you're going through all the requirements and making sure that what you're designing meets the customer's demands. Then you have the design phase where you're actually designing and optimizing that design to meet the requirements. The third step is you move into actually making the space station. The module is the largest piece. Uh, that's the eight meter that a uh, design I was telling you about. Our partner on that is Airbus. Uh, that module will likely be manufactured in Europe. So Airbus is a partner. Our, but Airbus is a very important partner to this project. Uh, we're very proud to have them on our team. And uh, they are uh, one of our joint venture partners within Starlab Corporation. So this is as much a European space station as it is an American space station. If you look into the past, then we had a kind of space race between the US and uh, Russia, obviously. Could it be, from your point of view, that in the future we have a space race between the U.S. and China, for example? Because, of course, other nations are trying to build their own space stations, probably, and so on. We don't know yet what's coming there. I, th I think we're already in a space race, uh, U.S. and China. The way I uh, explain it is there are many countries that gravitate towards the 
uh, international space station model. And there are other countries that are gravitating towards the Chinese model. So think of it as Apple and Android, right? They're compatible, they're operating in the same uh, sphere, if you will, uh, but they're, they're independent platforms. And so I think that's where we are, and increasingly that will be the case. And countries will have to pick. Uh, do they want to be part of the Android system or the Apple system? And how much money do you need to finance this whole project? Well, we're not commenting on the exact numbers, but it's uh, much, 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 much less expensive than the Inter International Space Station, so orders of magnitude cheaper. Uh, and that's because we're taking advantage of new technologies. Uh, it's a commercial endeavor, uh, so we can move you know, a bit more entrepreneurially than uh, perhaps uh, the government can. Uh, so it will be expensive, but it won't be nearly as expensive as other stations, the Mir station that Russia built, the Chinese space, uh, space station that they built, or the International Space Station. How can you make sure that that what is developed then in the future Star Lab is not dangerous for mankind, for example, you know? How do you control this? Yeah, it's a very, very important uh, problem that we take very seriously, but that's part of the requirements, that's part of the design phase. Uh, you need the ability to maneuver the station. You need the ability, heaven forbid, if there's a crew uh, emergency to get that crew back down to Earth safely. So all those things are being designed into it. You once said that it's necessary to democratize going up into space. More people should be able to go up into space. Yeah. Why, is, why is that necessary? Because it's such a gift. Imagine if I could give you a magic pill that you take it, it transforms your life, it transforms the way you see the world. Uh, it really is, space it really is that magic uh, drug. Uh, it doesn't scale very well, right? Sending millions of people to space is, is a fantasy right now. Uh, but the goal would be, imagine building Star Lab, imagine you having a UN Security Council meeting on Star Lab, or a G20 meeting on Star Lab. I think it, you would, we would have a different outcome if they were meeting up there instead of here in uh, Davos. But at the moment one has the feeling going up into space is like a rich man's game. What do you say to this argument? Uh, I agree with that argument, and um, that's why I had founded uh, a nonprofit, Space for Humanity, and we, the mission is to send everyday people to space in return for doing something for Earth. And we've now sent four people to space, um, all female. Uh, free of charge? Free of charge. Free of charge. But in return, they have to do something tied to the UN Sustainable Development Goals benefiting Earth. So they, they, it's not Can free. Can you give us an example? Uh, so the first Mexican-born female, Katya, um, has went. Her initiative is around STEM education. So she's meeting with the Mexican president regularly. They're uh, forming a center for STEM education for young women in Mexico. Uh, so that's an example. Uh, we sent the first African-born female to space, an Egyptian national. Uh, she's looking to democratize access to space in the Arab world. Uh, so these, these are the examples. So when you think about space, is your, do you only look positively at space and think there are so many opportunities? Or do you see also problems? I'm an optimist, so I mostly see uh, positive things. Um, it is an issue. The U.S. has a space force now. China has the equivalent of that. So I do worry about the militarization of space, but there's so much hope and so much potential for space to benefit life here on Earth uh, that I like to focus on the positive. If you talk about your dream, what would you love to get developed in space on your future Star Lab? Well, I see low Earth orbit as the lily pad for humanity to move deeper into space. So imagine a commercial sector with many star labs, all collaborating, a village, if you will, in low Earth orbit. And that enables us perhaps to go to the moon and live and work on the moon. And then that perhaps enables, enables us to go even further and deeper into space. So that's my vision, is that we're taking these baby steps. We're like the first fish who flopped onto the beach and became mammals, you know, way uh, way back when. I, I, I see that as kind of where we are in our evolution right now. Thank you very much. Thank you.